Hello, bonjour, buenos dias, ni hao, hello. Welcome to the Chapel in York Roundtable. I'm Sue Cunningham, President and CEO of the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. CAPES is the membership organization for those who champion the successes of their institutions. CAPES serves advancement professionals across all disciplines, fundraising, alumni relations, advancement services, marketing and communications. Because CASE has a global membership in more than 80 countries, it gives me great pleasure to know these roundtables are occurring around the world. One of the core competencies that CASE espouses is global and cultural competence. As education is a global endeavor, intercultural understanding and communications are fundamental for success and advancement. I've had the great pleasure of living and working in three different continents during my career, and in each of my roles, I have spent significant time engaging with people from different countries and regions, all with the shared passion of advancing education to transform lives and society. The last year has proven to us that whether or not we are able to travel, our engagement with one another in person or through other means is vital. Relationships matter deeply in our work. I thank Chapel in York for its long relationship with CASE and for creating these opportunities for you to engage in robust discussion. Enjoy. Um, welcome everybody. I think everybody's here and everyone's been let in. So welcome to the Chaplain York International Roundtable. Um, today is the European, or this is the European session in English focusing on international fundraising for education institutions. So welcome everybody. For those that don't know, the roundtables began with our first international fundraising across borders, the IFAB event in November 2020, which grew out of Chuck in York's 25 year history, working with organizations and not-for-profits um, who fundraise across the globe. At IFAB, we gathered a huge amount of knowledge and resources and wanted to continue the discussion post the event um, around what was being presented. So we made these round tables to carry on the discussion. We're delighted today to be joined by um, our first guest. I'll move on to the others afterwards, but the first guest is uh, Rob. Donaldson, he's the Executive Director of Advancement at the University of Aberdeen. Rob, let's wave. <laughs> Rob brings over 30 years of professional experience leading award-winning advancement programs of our not-profit organizations in higher education and healthcare. Prior to coming to the University of Aberdeen to oversee fundraising and alumni engagement programs in 2019, he served as the Executive Director of Development and Alumni Relations at UNE University of uh, College in Cork in Ireland, and as Vice President Development and Alumni Relations at Wilfrid Laurier, I hope I said that right, University in Waterloo in Canada, where he led a team that is named the, uh, that, sorry, when he led a team that's uh, named as his business school. He also led multi-million dollar campaigns for two hospital foundations. Acknowledged for his leadership in the area of charitable accountability, Rob led the first registered charity in Canada to earn the ethical fundraising license and the first university to earn the standard accreditation designation. He's spoken at several national and international conferences of the Canadian Association of Gift Planners, Canadian Council for the Advancement of Education, the CCAE, and the Association of Healthcare Philanthropy, and has served on the board of the CCAE. He was named in 2013 as the outstanding fundraiser professional by the Association of Fundraising Professionals for the Golden Horseshoe. He's a busy chap. Um, and he also received the Mission Legacy Award for St. Joseph's Health System. Um, Rob has a keen interest in international development and was part of a community development project in Nicaragua and served on a national fundraising committee of Canadian international development agencies. He also led the Wilfrid Laurier University response to the Syrian refugee crisis in sponsorship in sponsoring three families. Rob, as well as doing all of that, is married and has five adult children. He's an avid runner and has completed five marathons, including the Boston Marathon. So he's a busy guy. <laughs> so welcome to Rob. Joining him is Renata Bauscher, the Disbursement and Operations Manager at Erasmus Trust. Renata um, uh, is the operations manager of Erasmus Trust Fund, and she's poor, which supports students and researchers of Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Renata obtained her PhD at Erasmus University researching the fiscal barriers to cross-border giving, 
The PhD thesis was on tackling the international tax barriers to cross-border charitable giving, and it was published by the IBFD, which is the leading publisher on international taxation. Previously, she's worked in different positions as a fundraiser, managing director and consultant at arts organisations in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Alongside her job at Erasmus Trustmonds, Renata conducts research at the Erasmus School of Law, focusing on inst institutional context for international philanthropy. She's published several book chapters and articles in both professional and international peer-reviewed journals, among other uh, intertax journal of empirical legal studies, Canadian Journal of Comparative and Contemporary Law. She was a speaker at the AO, European Research Network on Philanthropy, and the annual conference on empiric empirical legal studies at Duke Law School, conference on cultural policy research at the University of Hildesheim, and the international conference of the Association of Cultural Economics International at the University de Quebec in Montreal. So thank you for joining, Renard, if you want to give us a wave as well. Joining this very qualified duo is Stuart Krantz, another qualified chap, president of the International Fundraising Services for Jack in York. Stuart has also worked for over two decades in executive fundraising leadership with roles at Harvard University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and the UC San Diego. Throughout his career, Stuart's consulted with charities and not-for-profit organizations globally, and has personally solicited gifts from all sizes up to a million dollars multi-millions of dollars. In addition, Stuart has led teams that have raised hundreds of millions of gifts from generous individuals, families, foundations and corporations. Stuart gives away. <laughs> it's wonderful to have all three speakers, very qualified speakers, here to answer your questions and, and join the conversation. So a bit of background about the roundtables. Um, it's hosted by Chapel York Foundation all over the world. So here we're at the European one. Um, my name is Helen Maynard Hill and I represent the Netherlands Foundation. I am British from my accent, you can probably tell, but I've been living in the Netherlands for about 13 years. I fundraise in the UK and all over Europe, helping um, different organisations throughout the world. Although I'm the host speaker today, um, most of the speaking will be done by the three speakers I've just introduced. Um, and I've asked them to do a 10 minute introduction, given their experience and sharing their knowledge with you. I'd like to encourage you to ask questions about the chat box whilst they're speaking, or once all the speakers have spoken, we have some time allocated at the end for any Q and A's in the discussion. Also, it's good to know we will be recording the session as some people who haven't been able to make it today have asked to be sent the recording so they don't miss out. Um, Chatham House rules apply, which means that this is a trusted environment. So um, to try and understand and resolve any complex problems and what, what goes on to or stays on to. So before Rob, kicks off and starts, um, I'd like to introduce a quick video from Sue Cunningham, who's the president and the CEO of ACE. Hello, bonjour, buenos dias, ni hao, hello. Welcome to the Chapel in York Roundtable. I'm Sue Cunningham, President and CEO of the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. CAPES is the membership organization for those who champion the successes of their institutions. CAPES serves advancement professionals across all disciplines, fundraising, alumni relations, advancement services, marketing and communications. Because CAPES has a global membership in more than 80 countries, it gives me great pleasure to know these roundtables are occurring around the world. One of the core competencies that CASE espouses is global and cultural competence. As education is a global endeavor, intercultural understanding and communications are fundamental for success and advancement. I've had the great pleasure of living and working in three different continents during my career. And in each of my roles, I have spent significant time engaging with people from different countries and regions all with the shared passion of advancing education to transform lives and society. The last year has proven to us that whether or not we are able to travel, our engagement with one another in person or through other means is vital. Relationships matter deeply in our work. I thank Chapel in York for its long relationship with CASE and for creating these opportunities for you to engage in robust discussion. Enjoy.
Lovely. Thank you uh, to Sue for that lovely introduction. Um, so let's kick off. Uh, Rob, would you like to take the virtual floor? You're on mute, Rob. <laughs> the most said uh, phrase in the last year and a half. You know, I went to click that on and it didn't work. I just wanted to say thank you, Helen, for uh, the kind introduction and the, the comments. Um, I like to tell people that if, if they had five kids, they'd take up marathon running too. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm really pleased to be here and I'm grateful that Chaplain York is hosting this event. I really think this kind of dialogue is really important for all of us as uh, professionals in the um, development and alumni relations field. So I'm pleased to be here and I hope that I uh, am, am able to impart some uh, uh, helpful um, wisdom today, if that's possible. So I, I'll begin just by saying, and it came out in the, in the introduction, um, I've worked in three countries, Canada, Ireland, and now in Scotland. My experience has primarily been fundraising in Canada. Um, but, you know, in my experience, I think many of the same principles that apply to domestic fundraising equally apply to international fundraising. Um, Sue Cunningham just mentioned the importance of relationships. Of course, that's absolutely fundamental to the work we do, no matter what country we're working in. The importance of aligning donor, the, the donor to the right project within the institution, uh, finding creative ways to engage them in the life of the university um, that enhances that and builds that relationship. These are all common elements, um, no matter what country you're working in. Similarly, and this is an obvious and kind of a foundational element, but the need for good records. Um, obviously that's critical to the work that we do. And we need to make sure that our systems are, are adaptable to different types of international uh, addresses that we would find around the world. In, in my experience, strong chapter activity with alumni has been really helpful in fostering cultural awareness um, for us as staff members, but also in our um, in interactions with other alumni in various countries. Um, of course, chapters are also linkages to potential donors as well, um, but understanding the, the cultural nuances, I think, is really critical in international fundraising. Having people on the ground uh, to be a sounding board to give you insights into the country, its customs, its expectations, as, as I said earlier, its nuances, that's all very critical to being successful in international fundraising. Uh, you know, the last thing we want to be is a bull in a china shop, so to speak. We, we want to make sure we're sensitive to the cultural differences that we encounter. So it's really important to talk to those people on the ground. And of course, your alumni are a tremendous uh, source of, of wisdom and knowledge in that regard. Engaging alumni on the ground for your events so that you can be conscious of local customs in terms of what events are appropriate. I mean, events are a great way to be cultivating relationships and engaging people with a view to further follow up for fundraising purposes. And so again, understanding the local customs is critical. I think all of us have experienced um, the challenges of COVID, but one of the benefits we've, we've all encountered with COVID in the past year has been that it's opened up uh, new donors and uh, new opportunities to, to engage alumni on an international basis. And I think uh, those um, virtual events will endure long after the pandemic is over. It's been one of the few silver linings, I think, in, um, in international relations, international fundraising this year. We've reached out to audiences that would never have attended our events had they been held in a particular city. The other benefit that we've encountered with COVID in terms of reaching people is we've utilized our, our principal or our president um, far more on an international scale than we might otherwise have done if we were required to travel. Uh, to continue to foster those relationships with donors and with alumni and prospective donors, we've held briefings with the principal where he has provided a, a brief update um, to the group who've assembled on the progress and plans of the university and then opening up the floor to questions and it's then an opportunity for us to do follow-up the people who attend those events um, but th that's been uh, a really important way for us to reach an international audience at a challenging time for travel but as I said earlier this is um, a technique I think we'll continue to use long after the pandemic because I think we all agree that in-person events will still be necessary but we'll be using virtual events to stay in touch with alumni I think Quite a bit more. Uh, in my experience in international fundraising, engagement of the institution's leadership is, is critical. Um, it's particularly true, I think, in um, Asia, where respect for authority is, is a very important um, cultural trait. 
Um, in, in my experience, the senior most representative of the institution is often given uh, pride, pride of place in meetings. And to have the principal or president of your institution or other senior leadership visit um, an international destination is a major gesture of respect. And it's, it's an important way to foster your relationships internationally, to build trust and confidence so that you can then engage them in other ways and, and hopefully um, engender their, their financial support. Um, I've had some experience working in the United States as well, not living there, but working with alumni and donors in, in that country. And I think one thing that uh, won't be news to anyone who's on this call is that it's a dominant feature of um, US university culture to have this very well-developed culture of philanthropy. The expectation that one would give back to their alma mater is very, very well-developed in the United States. In my experience in Canada, Ireland, and Scotland, the culture of giving to your university is not as heavily embedded as it is in the United States. In those three countries, um, they're more similar, I think, in their approach to fundraising. It's slightly more low key, I think. Uh, alumni pride is still very significant, but I think the history in each of those three countries of state support of higher education has meant that our culture of giving on a wide scale is not as developed as it is in the United States. Although in recent decades, uh, that's changed dramatically with uh, large philanthropic gifts becoming more common in all three countries. Uh, I was noting recently that Trinity College in Dublin just secured a 30 million euro gift. Uh, the University of Toronto completed a billion dollar campaign. So I think these countries are catching up with the United States, but I'm not sure that that um, culture of philanthropy is, is as embedded on such a wide scale as I believe it is in the United States. An illustration of that is when I worked at University College Cork in Ireland, we did an alumni survey in which more than half of those surveyed said that it was inappropriate to ask for money. Now, I'm not suggesting that that view is pervasive in Ireland um, at all. It, it might have just have been unique to that university, but I think it might suggest that the culture of philanthropy is not as well developed as it might be in other, other parts of the world, particularly in the US. Attitudes to giving may be different among expats living in countries versus natural born citizens of those countries who studied abroad and returned home. Um, in my experience, limited experience so far being in Scotland, a Scot who's living in the US may have a different attitude towards philanthropy than an American who studied in Scotland and is now back in the United States. So you wanna be conscious of um, the, the different experiences of each of those types of potential donors. And I think that's another reason why it's so important to have good records um, of those international students who studied at your institution, even if it was just for a year and then returned to their home country because they, they might have a different expectation of alumni relations and philanthropy. To conclude though, I, I think in the end, an international donor won't be that different from donors in any other country. Uh, my feeling is that they're gonna wanna know what impact their gift will have, what difference it will make, and how will someone's life or some institution be better as a result of their philanthropy? I think all, all philanthropy boils down to those solid relationships and the desire of an individual to wanna to make an impact. And so I think that's fundamental to fundraising internationally, no matter what country you're in. But as I said earlier, I think it's really important to be sensitive to the cultural nuances in the country in which you're working. So I'll conclude there, but uh, happy to hear the other speakers and engage in a discussion with, with everyone. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. That fascinating, fascinating beginning insight into, into your personal experiences of the different cultures. Good to hear. Um, so Renata, you want to go next? Yes, of course. So um, I currently work at the Erasmus Trust Fund, which is a separate uh, legal entity, a foundation that supports Erasmus University. I guess that where most um, uh, development professionals at universities are located within university, we are a separate entity. And um, that has its uh, advantages and disadvantages, but let's no, not go into that. What we do is that for university, we try to attract funds to support research and uh, students. And we do so by approaching our alumni, but also those uh, parents of current students and um, everybody who's 
basically interested or has a heart for education here in the city of Rotterdam. Um, our university is known for the entrepreneurial, uh, for an entrepreneurial spirit. We have a, a, a really good business school, the Rotterdam School of Management, which has produced a lot of successful business people. And um, uh, in the past year, this has been something we play, played into uh, or we tapped into and we've launched a, a, a fund that uh, supports students who want to sort of set up their own startup. And our alumni donate to that specific fund, but they also perform as mentors. We mainly raise funds in the Netherlands, uh, but we also have um, donors residing abroad. And these are, for example, uh, parents from foreign students, uh, alumni who have moved abroad. We have a circle in uh, the United Kingdom. We have donors in the US. Uh, working on Canada and Belgium. And um, well, although this is a meeting for fundraising professionals, um, I'm the disbursement manager at the Erasmus Trust Fund. And I focus uh, on, on the projects that, that we grant with the funds raised. And I guess I'm not invited here to talk about that part of my work, but um, I guess I'm invited because I also obtained a PhD in the tax law at Erasmus University in which I focused on tax incentives for cross-border charitable giving. And within my research, I focused on arts organizations, but I guess that what applies for arts organizations also applies to um, uh, raising funds for education. And in fact, I could already see when I started working at Trust Funds that the barriers and the hiccups that uh, the arts organizations that I studied shared with me while fundraising abroad, that these are also hiccups that we come across in our organization. So what I would like to do is to focus a bit on the um, uh, tax as aspects of international fundraising and to combine the things I've seen during my research, um, which I derive from like the, the, the um, things I've seen within the 36 case studies that I did for my research, but also to um, highlight some elements that I come across in my day-to-day -day work. So, um, uh, Rob already mentioned the cultural differences, which of, is, of course, an, uh, a big barrier in inter in, or, or, or a challenge or an opportunity when raising uh, funds abroad, just how you look at it. Um, and um, that cultural difference also comes uh, forward when raising funds abroad and looking into the tax aspect. So where many fundraisers who uh, are in touch with foreign donors are very well aware of the fiscal system within their own country. They have limited knowledge of the um, tax laws that apply to the foreign donor. So every country has its own jurisdiction, its own tax legislation. And where in the Netherlands we have, for example, a tax deduction. Um, in another country, there might be a totally different uh, incentive or no incentive at, at all for gifts to uh, higher education. In Belgium, for example, you have a tax credit, whereas in the UK you have the gift aid scheme. So that differs um, uh, for every country. And um, what I see um, is that many fundraisers have difficulty to ha get a hold on uh, the, the, the uh, foreign uh, tax legislation, but are tempted to um, make claims about it or inform the donor about it. And I would, well, my advice would be to be very cautious there. It's perhaps better to direct your donor to his personal um, uh, fiscal lawyer than to um, um, make false claims or advise them in the wrong way. Um, besides, uh, the knowledge among the limited knowledge among many fundraisers on cross border or on the tax incentives involved in cross border charitable giving, um, they are not not always very sensitive to what it takes for an organization to be eligible to receive a, a gift uh, with a tax benefit. So in the Netherlands, um, uh, churches are, for example, organizations that can rely on on a tax benefit when receiving a, a gift. This is not the case, for example, in Belgium. Their uh, religious organizations are not eligible for, are not recognized as public benefit entities and cannot receive um, a donation with a tax benefit. So these are all things to be aware of and to look into perhaps if you really want to have a conversation with your foreign donors. 
And then, but this is really difficult as it shows that tax law basically changes every year as do the criteria that an organization needs to comply with um, uh, to be eligible for a, a donation. To obtain a tax benefit on a cross-border donation, um, there are several options. So within the EU, there's the EU law and uh, the fundamental freedoms within the EU that allow donors to make a donation with a tax benefit to a charitable organization in another EU member state, as long as the organization in the other EU member state meets the requirements for charitable organizations in the country where the donor is resident. So for example, I am um, uh, subject to Dutch tax law. If I would want to make a contribution to um, uh, the University of um, Aberdeen to Rob's institution, then the um, University of Aberdeen would have to qualify as a charitable organization in the Netherlands and meet the requirements that are in place for Dutch uh, charitable organizations. Well, in the case of the Netherlands, um, the University of Aberdeen could apply for this uh, public benefit status in the Netherlands, and then I could donate with a tax benefit. If Rob would want to do the same to my university, donate to Erasmus University, that would be more difficult because um, based on national law in the UK, a foreign charity cannot just reg register as a, a public benefit entity and uh, Erasmus University would have to rely on the uh, fundamental freedoms within the EU law that the UK will grant the tax benefit to Rob as a donor. Well, this is not the message you want to uh, Tell your donor that they will only know afterwards whether based on EU law they qualify for a tax deduction. That brings in certain uncertainty and that is not something that, well that is not very much appreciated that makes it rather difficult for donors to estimate what they could give considering the tax whether considering that is uncertain whether a tax incentive applies and that came across during my research as a big drawback um, not to rely on, on, on EU law to grant foreign donors, uh, to help facilitate foreign donors to uh, give, relying on EU law uh, to obtain a tax incentive. What would work is establishing a foreign friends organization. So for example, Erasmus University could establish a foreign friends organization in the UK that gets recognized as a charity in the UK. However, that will take a lot, of, a lot of resources. Somebody needs to make sure that the annual audit is done. Um, the organization needs to comply with the, the, um, uh, the, the criteria that the UK applies. The, the, um, I always forgot, forget the English word, the statuten in Dutch. The, um, the bylaws. Thank you. The bylaws, indeed. Mm -hmm. that the bylaws meet the requirements under UK law. And these are all hiccups and time-consuming procedures that are not very attractive for most organizations when they only receive incidental gifts from, uh, from abroad. And therefore, in my research, I conclude that the intermediary organization is uh, the optimal way to uh, facilitate a foreign donor with tax benefit. And this is not an advertisement for the services of Chapel in York. This is actually what I really found in my research. But I found that um, the services of Chaplain York, but also a similar organization, organizations such as um, uh, Transnational Giving Europe, uh, the King Boudouin Foundation in the United States, by allowing your down donor to give through these intermediary organizations in their home country, um, they can obtain the tax benefit. And then the, the intermediary organization transfers the donation to your university. And that's the most efficient and effective solution currently to facilitate your foreign donors with a tax benefit. This will remain this way as long as uh, countries do not recognize foreign charities based on home country control. So based on the criteria that apply for charitable organizations in the countries where they, re where they are um, established. Um, I think concerning the... Uh, tax law, this is the main point I wanted to make, that for now it's efficient and uh, effective to rely on intermediary organizations, 
Also, if you look into the time investment needed, um, the intermediary organizations can also help you with informing you about the applicable um, requirements for your foreign donor and the tax laws in place. And um, uh, the costs that are involved are usually rather limited. If you consider the investment it would take to rely on EU law where you have to go to court, or if you rely on um, a foreign friends organization and you have to set this up yourself. So for most organizations, the intermediary uh, organization is the most low key, easy, accessible and fast solution to facilitate foreign donors to the tax center. I think I would like to leave it at that. Uh, okay. <laughs> Great. I was just going to jump in and say, I promise everybody we didn't pay Renata to say that. <laughs> it's actually done on her research. So for those that don't know, um, uh, Chaplain New York can help organisations um, with their international fundraising and their fund giving um, and help with the tax laws. Because actually, it's an interesting point that when you seek um, fundraising in different countries, obviously, you need to consider the different tax laws and that can be quite complex. Um, and that's one thing that we can help with. And I think it's really good to raise that, actually. You know, we're talking about um, fundraising for educational institutions. But, um, yeah, maybe it's something that, that hasn't been considered or it's kind of not top of mind. But it's really good to kind of bring that to, to the, the conversation um, and to say, you know, it is a consideration. And, you know, there are organisations that can help with finding, you know, finding the solutions and to help you guide you through the complicated world of tax. On that note, um, just as a bit of an advert, in I think it's September, we're actually doing a round table on tax law, uh, international tax law, and we're talking about just, you know, expanding more on what Renata touched on, on how to, how to fundraise and how to uh, go about, you know, finding the path through the tax legislation internationally. So um, you will all be contacted about that. That's kind of something to look forward to, tax law round table, exciting. Um, <laughs> and for those, please don't, for sorry. Those, <coughs> sorry. If I may, for those who would like to know more about it, um, as uh, Helen mentioned, my uh, PhD was published by IBFD and you can order it uh, online or, and there is also many case studies on how others went about and descriptions on, on different systems, uh, different, uh, um, uh, systems in which countries grant tax benefits if you want to get a better understanding of how that works. Great, thank you. Um, just another quick reminder, um, please do feel free in, to uh, write any questions that you might have for any of the speakers or me um, in the chat box. So just um, type away as the speakers are, uh, typing, uh, are speaking and then uh, once Stuart's finished then we can address any questions you might have or please feel free to raise your virtual hand and we can do it um, as a conversation. So, Stuart, take it away. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Helen. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to follow these two <laughs> very experienced, wise uh, folks in the fundraising world. And what I'm going to try to do here is try to ground some of the, the information from both of the speakers into what's happening uh, currently in international fundraising for uh, education. Um, it's, it's a real dynamic environment, as we all know, uh, in education fundraising uh, during, during the pandemic and uh, slowly getting out of it. But we're still certainly, all of us are still feeling the uh, sort of uh, the effects of, of it all. So I wanted to sort of pose a couple of uh, questions, three questions actually, for all of us to consider over the next few minutes as I share some of these considerations. Some of, some of the considerations are a follow-up with, um, with some of the stuff Rob's uh, shared. So um, it's not a duplicative, but I think it's an enhancement of some of the things he's emphasized as well. But here are, the, here are three questions for us to consider. Um, one, uh, has anything about the fundamentals of fundraising changed because of, of the pandemic? I mean, are the principles that were sound prior to the pandemic still sound? Or are there considerations and fundamentals that have changed? And, and if so, 
what, what has changed for us? And I think it's important for all of us to sort of explore this. Uh, two, um, what changes are necessary for us in our fundraising efforts uh, internationally that are going to get the best results for us and for the institutions we fundraise for right now and in the years ahead? And three, can our institutions, can our academic institutions use the experience of these times to improve fundraising in the longer term? Okay, so let's just keep those questions in the back of our mind. We'll come back to it after, uh, after my brief presentation and try to answer them at least in, in very sort of general terms. But I think these are questions that all of us should be uh, exploring with our leadership and our colleagues back in our institutions. So one consideration clearly, and it's something Rob mentioned, is sort of the whole notion of the cases for support. You know, we realize that COVID is probably one of the greatest global challenges faced in a generation, right? And in many ways, the big question that fundraisers and fundraising leadership is confronting is this, what did we do to adjust and learn from the experience? And, you know, this has a lot to do with sort of our case and how universities frame um, their philanthropic uh, and case and giving opportunities for prospects and donors. There's really two messages. I mean, we can boil it down to a couple of things. One, uh, a lot of universities and academic institutions, uh, they say that we're great, so help us get even better. And if you give us funds, if you give us gifts, we'll get better at it, okay? Other institutions are framing their case that we're here to help solve really important complex problems. And philanthropy is so critical for us to succeed at that. Now, it's not hard to identify which is better suited for, for now. So I think the action point worth uh, sharing here is this is a crucial time to revisit and review cases for support and ensure that they're addressing the concerns that are important to prospects and donors right now. And the question is, can we just go back to the way it was in our old cases? And that's probably missing a very important opportunity uh, to rethink how you're positioning the institution for future philanthropic success from donors around the world. Something Rob talked about, which really resonated with me, which was the whole cultural component here. You know, um, I, I totally concur that we don't need to overcomplicate this too much, but it is critically important that, uh, the, that fundraisers are, understand the sensitivity of where they're fundraising. I mean, you know, and really kind of become uh, sensitive to how uh, donors and, and potential supporters in the country that they're fundraising are thinking about um, philanthropy as a whole. And, you know, we shouldn't make too many assumptions. Um, and there are ways in which I think universities can really tap into expertise around cultural sensitivity. I mean, many large, complex, comprehensive universities have experts uh, that in the areas that the development office is fundraising. And the question really is, are development offices really tapping into the expertise that are on campus uh, in ways that can help them um, ensure that their activities, both online and in person, are culturally appropriate? And I think that's something that uh, many universities can, um, can do um, better than they're doing right now. The third consideration I think that's worth uh, raising right now is about how universities and how educational and academic institutions cultivate and solicit um, uh, and how the pandemic in many ways is changing that and probably will change uh, for the future. 
you know, crisis management advisors around the world often say that after the crisis are over, people will remember how organizations responded to the crisis. And no one's going to forget COVID-19, of course, but they'll remember how your institution dealt with a crisis. And in many ways, development officers and development leadership have a great opportunity to use, utilize the, what's happened this past year as a way to express uh, sensitivity and connection with prospects and donors and alumni in new ways. I mean, do you ask how the pandemic has affected them? Are you offering expertise in ways that can really be helpful to alumni and prospects and donors? Are you seeking their opinion about how the university positions itself for the future uh, after the pandemic is over? And on and on and on. I think there are a lot of ways in which development leadership can really be proactive in thinking about cultivation in new and creative ways because of what ha has happened this past year. Something else Rob said, which I just resonated so much, which was volunteers. I mean, there are so many great examples about how uh, international fundraising efforts have utilized volunteers on the ground in countries around the world either on committees or otherwise. And just as an add-on to something that was said earlier, the idea of online participation and using Zoom and other sources of, uh, of ways to do it actually can help create new avenues for committees to be created in other countries. And that kind of engagement, I think uh, there's example after example of, of clients of Chapel and York, for example, that have benefited from that kind of expanded uh, technology and the utilization of volunteers. So I'm a big fan of that. And I think it's something that development offices are going to integrate more and more. Senior leadership is another thing that Rob mentioned. I couldn't agree more. I think the new technologies that are out there now can actually enhance and make it easier for senior leadership to engage in all sorts of new ways. And there are lots of examples and I would welcome, of course, either through this uh, round table or otherwise sharing examples. I'm starting to develop a database of all sorts of neat opportunities wine and cheese stewardship virtual events, multi-generational family scholar uh, presentations, virtual or award presentations, and the list goes on and on. Wonderful creativity and innovation that's coming out of universities around the globe. I certainly encourage all of you to think outside the box as it relates to engaging senior leadership and opening up new avenues to, to uh, prospect and donor engagement. It's important to remember to stay optimistic at this time. It can be challenging, but I think it's very important. There's always a demand for education around the world. Alumni live throughout the globe, of course. Um, academic institutions do much more than just prepare students for a career. They train generations of leaders who are solving big problems. Cases can be crafted around that in new and important ways. It's crucial to know, to, to focus on what we know about fundraising, even though so much is changing around us. Certainly, time tested. Uh, <laughs> is to engage is so critical. Uh, but using these new technologies, using this experience over the past year to create and innovate. So just to finish up, back to those early questions. Has anything about fundraising fundamentals changed? Are the principles still sound? Well, following up to some, something that was said earlier, yes, the principles are sound and organizations that have being weak in the past in terms of donor relations, stewardship are not as well placed really during these challenging times and in the future. 
So what changes, what changes are necessary to get the best results? We talked a little bit about it uh, over the past, use of technology, leadership in new creative ways, uh, make sure your case is solid, et cetera. And finally, can institutions use the experiences of this time to improve their fundraising in the long term? Absolutely, yes. We urge you to jump beyond just coping with what's happening and look at radical change going forward to how you engage your donors and prospects and volunteers to, to make them make your better after COVID is, is completely out. Think of this time as your Uber moment, as your key innovation moment in order to fundamentally shift how you engage with prospects and donors, but utilize some of the absolute core principles and sound principles that are basic to building relationships going forward. So I'll leave it at that. Back to you, Helen. Great. Thanks, Stuart. It's really, really good points, actually. Good questions for us all to consider, I think, and to, you know, to, to take away and really go back to our teams and consider. We've actually had um, a question from Becky Gilbert. I, I can ask on Becky's behalf. And she said, um, thanks for the interesting presentations. She was wondering if anyone is aware of data or could recommend a reliable source of information with respect to alumni and parent giving engagement rates in Europe. Um, exclusive of the UK and beyond uh, case, which makes it available. She's interested to find out relevant benchmarks for engagement work vis-a-vis -vis alumni and parents in various continental European countries. So I don't know if, Rob, if you want to take that one to begin with. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of... Uh... Other sources of that kind of information, Helen. Um, um, what did you also mention regarding? Oh, one second, Rob. Adrian, can you mute? Adrian, we can hear you. Adrian? <laughs> Maybe carry on, Rob. <laughs> yeah, I'm not familiar with other sources of that kind of information. The Ross Case Survey is, is one of the best resources, I think, to provide some of that data, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of other, other sources beyond that. Renata? Yes, I think it's an excellent question. Um, I'm not aware of uh, data either. We did try to make an investigation ourselves within the Netherlands. And um, what we came across is that actually giving rates dif or differ a lot. Um, so what we consider a major donor is very different, is already very, differs already within the Netherlands, within institutions within the Netherlands. So for mm -hmm. one university within uh, uh, the Netherlands, uh, 5,000 euros might be a major gift, whereas we only speak of, within my organization, we only speak of a major donor when they uh, make a pledge of uh, uh, one million or more. So that already makes a difference. And then I also came across in my research that it differs a lot across countries. So I heard Rob mention uh, uh, one billion uh, gifts in Canada and uh, uh, 30 million gifts in the UK, I, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, in, in Belgium, a major gift would already be uh, a gift of 1,000 euros. There is mainly pocket money that people give. It's not accustomed to give to uh, uh, schools or universities. So there's, a, yeah, my expectation is that it will be very difficult to um, uh, set standards internationally. Mm -hmm. Due to the cultural differences, I guess. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Stuart, have you got any, any thoughts? Uh, it, if the question is about the definition of major gifts, I thought that was that the chat was more about participation rates uh, for European and um, institutions. Uh, from the participation rates, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to defer to to Rob and Renat on that. With regards to the uh, definition of major gifts, this has been a um, a constant question across uh, institutions around the world, and especially in the United States. And what we what we realized in our studies in the United States, it doesn't really matter um, what uh, an institution, uh, com comparing your, what is defined as a major gift to another institution, what, what more is more relevant is how the institution itself wants to think of itself, uh, it, it, how, how it wants to define a major gift. Um, because, you know, 
it's not like the donor is, is thinking, oh, I want to make a major gift. The donor is thinking, I want to make a gift that's, that is meaningful. And so it's really in many ways a sort of an internally internal construct. And I, I totally agree with Renata. It just doesn't, it, you know, what matters more is how you organize, how you develop your giving opportunities that are compelling. And if you want to sort of begin to divide out the definition of a major principle or transformational gift, by all means do it. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start worrying as an institution much about whether you're in alignment with a like institution. I would focus on what you want to, as an institution, think of as a really important gift and steward gifts of that size in a way that reflects the importance of it. Yeah, I guess it's kind of comparing apples and oranges, right? So, so kind of thing. Um, so one question I had actually was about, uh, it, it keeps getting mentioned about cultural sensitivities and obviously that's a key thing when you're fundraising internationally. I just wondered what your collective experiences were about when you're trying to fundraise internationally and be sensitive to those um, cultures that aren't familiar to you or you're not, you know, you're not surrounded by. So how, how would you go about understanding or getting to understand those cultural sensitivities from the places that you're trying to fundraise from? Oh, well, maybe I'll, I'll start. Um... A lot of universities have some tremendous resources in that regard. Um, you know, our university does a lot of international student recruitment. Uh, the number of international students at the University of Aberdeen is quite significant. So they're working in countries all over the world. And so, um, for example, pre-COVID, um, I, I visited Qatar. We have a campus in Qatar. And I spoke to the international recruitment people at the university to begin to understand, well, what are the cultural nuances in Qatar that I need to be aware of? What, what are the things that I definitely should not do and what should I do? Um, and so I think all of us should probably look into our own institutions. There may well be some international experience. You might even have an international um, academic component there, international studies of some sort. Those people might be worth talking to as well to, um, to gain some experience. But that was certainly helpful for me talking to the resources we already had. Renata? Yeah, I think the way we go about it is also to uh, closely collaborate with either existing uh, donors or uh, close contacts we have in the country uh, where we want to raise funds. So for example, in the UK, we have a very kind gentleman who is one of our uh, patrons, but he's also uh, very willing to help us to overcome uh, any um, cultural differences. So he informs us, or he can this is posted on the recent developments on what um, our network within or our potential donors within the UK are up to and what, um, uh, what is important for them, what we, keep in mind, we need to keep in mind when approaching them. So that's also a very valuable source of uh, information. And actually yeah. they can also be, a, he also functions as a mediator. As, so that's very, um, very generous of him to share. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Ms. Stewart? Um, you know, those are both fantastic. I mean, those are great uh, um, sources. I, I would probably just add in larger universities, faculty who, who have specialized in certain regions of the world, uh, there's a long tradition of them uh, supporting development offices uh, in the United States anyway, uh, with regards to cultural sensitivity. Yeah, it makes sense to kind of use who you've got and to make yeah make the most of, of the resources that you have internally. It makes sense. And, and one I might, other thing, might I just add one other thing about that? I mean, uh, you know, uh, sorry to cut you off. I, I, I think um, for international fundraisers, uh, utilizing the uh, networks of faculty who have links in different parts of the world are, is also an invaluable source. Um, and can help to expand prospect lists and do other kinds of, of uh, outreach and engagement. If you can, if you can tap into that, uh, you'd be well, well positioned in that area. Yeah, good point. Um, and, and we kind of talked about, we touched, or Stuart put, talked about um, the impact of COVID that obviously we've all been affected with. And I just wondered if, because you've only got a few minutes left, I wondered whether the, you had any, sorry to put in the spot, but any examples of like creative ways that you've seen universities that you've worked with or 
um, organisations that you work with that because of uh, because of the situation with COVID that you've seen that you want to share that you think that was really clever or inspirational way of fundraising or reaching out to donors that might possibly not have happened should uh, COVID not have happened. So I just put it out there to see really to anybody if you've, you've seen anything that you think that was really smart and a, a good way to overcome the pandemic. I'd, I'd love to hear any ideas. Perhaps I'll start. Um, one of the one of the greatest attributes or one of the, the biggest requirements of successful fundraising is having a sense of urgency. And the pandemic gave us all a sense of urgency in terms of raising funds for particular student needs, students who were impacted adversely um, by the uh, pandemic. But in terms of creative, so that enabled us to do some creative fundraising. But um, in, some other ideas though that I think work for us that we will continue because we couldn't travel, we uh, introduced these principles briefings where we would bring together small select groups of donors or prospects and uh, provide a briefing with the principal. And that was, that was great um, and really enabled us to reach a, a larger audience in, a part, in parts of the world that we wouldn't um, normally be traveling to. And then similarly with alumni events, um, we quickly pivoted to virtual events. And as I said in my opening comments, we were able to expand our audience dramatically. So those techniques I think are here to stay. We'll still have to have in-person sessions, but the virtual will still work. Yeah, yeah, good point. Anybody else? Yeah, and so- Oh, uh, sorry. I'll, I'll leave the floor to you, Gary, because- um, Oh, please, please. You can Renata, well, then I'll keep it. Renata and then I'll go to Gareth. I'll be very brief then. Um, <laughs> so uh, I totally subscribe, Rob, that the COVID crisis uh, emphasized the importance of science and research and education, and uh, not only to resolve the issues we face with COVID, but also to, to um, overcome other challenges, other major societal challenges. So I think that is really a uh, benefit of the crisis and um, in terms of creative ways to go about not being able to meet in person. Uh, what we did look for the launch of our startup fund is that we did a live broadcast and we were very afraid that it would not be engaging enough to, with our donors but in fact inviting them via Zoom to join in um, and meeting uh, having one-on-one -on -one meetings afterwards worked out really well for us. And it's right. nice because then also the students uh, were able to, um, who are involved as well, students could even um, uh, show little videos of the startups they want to uh, set up. So that was that was lovely interaction between donors, university uh, principals, and um, our students. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's potentially an uh, interaction that wouldn't normally happen as well in, in normal times, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Gareth, uh, just because we're running out of time a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very quickly. Um, this business about information and cultural background is very important. Um, where I start always, if I go to a country, and this may seem strange, is I go to what's the CIA World Book. And that's produced by the CIA on every country in the world. And it gives a lot of factual information, which is a great starting point. If for nothing else, if I'm talking to somebody, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, I can quote something that I know about Saudi Arabia, that person with me. And that's all come from the CIA World Book. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Helen. Right. No, that's okay. We're all going to go away and Google CIA World Book now. So. <laughs> <laughs> See, that, that's a very good it's a lovely uh, resource and it's also uh, we also use it a lot in, in research and uh, we then tend to for when it comes to taxes we tend to combine it with um, uh, several sources from the European Foundation Center for example who have overviews of the fiscal laws in the country so mm -hmm. that's a, a very nice combination if you want to do uh, want to look into different country situations Thank you. Yeah, mm. good point. Thank, thank you, Gareth. That's really super, really helpful. Um, if there, I don't think there's any other questions. Um, lots of people, I think, have to go. Um, 
Brilliant, really good, really lovely. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you to the speakers. Just a quick note before everybody disappears is we do have another round table next month on the 8th of July. And that one's talking about fundraising for um, organizations with a global audience. So if you, um, if you uh, have um, different um, offices or different sister offices or partners in other countries, then please do come along. Come along anyway if you're, you're interested in any of this. Uh, 8th of July, I'm sure you'll be getting an email about it. And I stand corrected about the roundtable on tax is actually in October. But again, I'm sure everybody will get information about this. And we will be circulating this recording. So if there's anything that you missed or you want to re revisit, then, um, then you're going to have a recording as well at your fingertips. So, yeah, just thank you once again to the wonderful speakers. We're really privileged to have all three of you come along and, and impart your knowledge. Thank you to everybody for taking the time out to come and visit. And please come back again next time. Oh, you will be, just really quickly, you will be receiving a questionnaire. So please take five minutes to, to complete the questionnaire. It's online, virtual, obviously. Um, uh, and we we really want your feedback to see how we can improve and, and make things even better. So thanks once again, and hopefully see you next month. Take care. Bye-bye.